We're supposed to thank all our wonderful sponsors. So there they are. They're awesome. Um, I work for this one. Just in case anyone was wondering. Um, okay. So what I'm here to talk about is test-driven development. And more specifically, why the hell you would want to do something quite so difficult as test-driven development. And this is me. You can see. That's about right. And I'm just a developer. That's what I do for a living. Anybody who was here in the morning, you will have seen a very similar slide. So. I'm going to start with a small tale from a Terry Pratchett book. Because that's obviously the way you would start any technical talk on development. So. The reason that the rich were so rich, by and reason, was because they managed to spend less money. Take Boots, for example. He earned $38 a month plus allowances. A really good pair of leather boots cost $50. But an affordable pair of boots, which were sort of okay for a season or two, and then leaked like hell when the cardboard gave out, cost about $10. Those were the kinds of boots Vimes always bought. And wore until the soles were so thin that he could tell where he was in Ankh-Morpork on a foggy night by the feel of the cold. But the thing was that good boots lasted for years and years. A man who could afford to pay $50 had a pair of boots that would still be keeping his feet dry in 10 years' time. While a poor man who could only afford cheap boots would have spent $100 on boots in the same time and would still have wet feet. This was the Captain Samuel Vimes Boots Theory of Socio-Economic Unfairness. So keep that in mind as we go through. Advance, down, up, do things. There we go. So anyone who's ever read Deming will be essentially saying, well, yeah, duh. So to go to Deming, what Deming would have to say about this in terms of our development, cease dependence on inspection to achieve quality. Specifically, that means having a look at absolutely everything we do after it's been done to see if it is good or not. Eliminate the need for inspection on a mass basis by building quality into the product in the first place. Now, this stuff all came from the manufacturing industry, right? This is how Toyota builds cars. They don't inspect it at the end of the line, they build it right at the start of the line. And they never send defective product down the line. Also, drive out fear. So that everyone may work effectively for the company. In other words, I know everything I do is OK because I have things that tell me immediately, give me feedback. I never have to worry, oh, did, does this stuff work or not? Because you have systems to tell you. And I'm not scared anymore. Now I can just go and do my job. So again, manufacturing industry, probably wondering, well, what's that got to do with us? When I say driving out fear, I don't mean like that. OK, so why? Why? did Deming come up with these kinds of things in what he was talking about? That's why. It's cheaper. This is how Toyota became the number one car manufacturer on the planet. They did all that stuff. They built in quality first because in the long term, it actually economically makes sense. OK, now you're wondering, well, what's that got to do with Agile? So let's recap. There are a few Agile values, there's four of them. I'm going to mention three of them, I think, eventually. First one is working software over comprehensive documentation. That doesn't mean you don't write any documentation, but we care about delivering software that actually works. We also care about responding to change over following a plan, because no plan survives contact with the enemy anyway. This is a principle. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. That's the one that really comes down to 
the quality aspect that we were just looking at with Deming. So specifically, when we want to take any tool on board, we want to look at, okay, well, what do I do? Okay? Practices, in other words, not just tools, but the practices we use. Because we've talked about values and principles, but then we actually got to do something. Evaluate it against those values and the principles. So, now we'll look at a, as it turns out, rather topical tool, test-driven development, or practice, really. I put in this talk before the internet blew up with DHH saying TDD was dead, out of interest. Um, so, I, it, this was then informed by that, but actually I was going to talk about this anyway. So. For what is test-driven development? That's test-driven development. Write one failing test for a really small chunk of stuff, get it passing, however you need to get it passing, and then refactor. And by refactor, that's make it work now the way I would like to see it work, get rid of the duplication, get rid of the nastiness that I may have created a little bit just getting that test passing, and improve things as I go. So that's TDD. Anything else that people talk about, writing all the tests first, that's not TDD. Writing it in a testable way and then writing the test later, that's not TDD. That does mean you have to think first. That's one of the hard parts. Because if I have to write a failing test, that means I have to actually think of what does this piece of code need to do. And that's where all of the other part of development starts coming in all the BA work and also even talking to your QA people with the customer, product owners and things about well, what is this, what are we actually trying to do? Knowing that before you write the code is usually a great idea. And TDD absolutely requires that you need to know what your particular little bit you're going to do does to actually help all of that. So that's the failing test. Now we're on to green test. So you do the least amount possible. This is good because this actually helps with simplicity. Simple things are usually easier to look after, which we'll touch on. And here's the rest of helping looking after. Now you can refactor. Now the reason you can refactor is because I now have a green test, with all the other green tests I wrote, if I'm a little bit further on, that tell me if I break something. It's as simple as that. I've got something that I can go and change the way everything works and oh, wouldn't it be great if this thing only had to talk to one thing instead of five. Great, you can go do that because the test will tell you if you broke it. So now I can, that's part of the eliminating fear thing. All of that helps you keep it simple because, okay, I made one simple change but that one simple change may have actually made the whole a little bit more complicated. So now I can make that simple change simple everywhere by getting rid of any duplication, for example. Or any other thing, making things more cohesive and less tightly coupled. Loosely coupled is what we're after, those kinds of things. In fact, those two principles, tight cohesion and loose coupling, if you do those everywhere, you pretty much, that's, that's the most concern you have to do. All the solid principles and stuff people talk about, that's just tight uh, cohesion and loose coupling just boiled down into a few redundant practices. And this gets us back to the dollars. If I can keep a simple system, I can look after it, I can now respond to change cheaply. So I'm satisfying my agile value, I'm responding to change over following a plan, because we learnt new stuff. We learnt that the customer needs different things. Lovely. Now it's easy to make that change because everything's well factored and simple and covered by tests. In other words, the change is cheap because you're investing up front in keeping everything in a really good state, rather than ending up with a more and more complicated system that is hard to change and therefore expensive to change. And then you don't want to change it, so you don't. That really means, in its entirety, that TDD is a design process. It's actually not about writing tests, actually involved and you happen to get a bunch of really good tests after it and that helps you but it's actually a design process which is great because building quality in in the first place 
is all about designing quality into the manufacturer of the product. So now we're starting to hook up the software world with the manufacturing world that Deming was from in building the quality in through the design process. And that's what we actually really mean by building quality in. So we're designing with our tests and that builds in that quality. That gives us back to working software. I know it works. Everything's green. I know exactly how it works as well because the tests tell me. There's a bunch of tests. It can't do anything that the tests say it can't do because they'd be red. So now I have working software. And if the software doesn't quite do what the customer needs, it's easy to change it so now that it does and, I, and the process to change it is to write another red test, get that green, <coughs> refactor, and I keep the software working and I'm also getting it closer to what the customer really needs. As a side effect, those tests then become our documentation for that exact reason. The system can only do what the tests say, this is what this does, as long as the build is green. So, that's our documentation. So in other words, we're also fulfilling our idea of we prefer working software over comprehensive documentation because the tests are automatically giving us living, changing, up-to-date, by definition, documentation. You can always supplement them with a little bit more if you need to. But a lot of people, if you follow XP, will simply say, maintain only the code and the tests as living artefacts and really don't worry about much else because it's going to be out of date and pointless. I said small bits at one point in that. And that's one of the great things about this. You don't have to think of it, the entire system up front. I can think about what is the one little thing I need to do that's going to make someone's life a tiny little bit better when I'm finished, write a test for that, and I can keep on making people's lives better in tiny little chunks, which means the thinking gets easier. So you do have to think up front, but you can think small up front rather than really big later on when it doesn't work or something. And that means that I can therefore make smaller changes. Which are less risky, by the way. And so smaller changes are easier to make and the way of responding to change is easier. Okay, so doing this by itself is okay, but doing it with other things is much more useful to you. Sorry, I'm just checking my time. So we combine, combine it with things like mainline development instead of feature branching. Because feature branching, to borrow from Deming again, if you create a feature branch you do pull requests, all you're doing is, is building up an inventory of changes to avoid the pain of having to integrate them all the time. And that's what inventory is all about. It's about hiding other problems. Okay? So overproduction leads to inventory buildup. Overproduction is the creator of all the other lean wastes. You can read all this. I didn't make all this up. This is all in books, right? Um, so, yeah, if we have this branch that I create and it lives for a couple of weeks or something like that with your feature on it, you're piling up this inventory of stuff that's never been integrated with all the other changes going on in the system and the risk piles up with that inventory and the potential problems pile up with that inventory and get hidden by it. So, also, um, so that directly relates then also to continuous delivery. If I have um, mainline development, I can then easily continuously deliver things to my customer to then get it validated by them and they can give me feedback and I can easily respond to the changes I need to make because everything's small and we go back around the circle again. All that encourages flow and that's really the secret of say Toyota's manufacturing system, it's flow. And when you can't flow you use things like Kanban and stuff to do really tiny batches instead of big batches. But when you can you just flow single pieces. So, you can't uh, talk about TDD without mentioning Ken Beck, because he invented it. Um, this is a, a famous quote. Any gap between what is on a programmer's desk and what is in production is a risk. So, obviously, the smaller those chunks are, the smaller the changes we're making, the more frequently we're pushing, more frequently we get it into production, the lower our risk is, because we can validate all our decisions, and it's the unvalidated decisions that are really the inventory that I'm talking about. All right, so there is another agile value that we haven't looked at yet. 
people and interactions over processes and tools, which is interesting because I've just spent the last 15 minutes or so talking about a process or tool, okay, practice. So, combine it with pairing. This is one of the real keys, and there are actually ways to learn this stuff in, like, ping pong pairing, for example, where one person writes the test so they can worry about the thinking and then they become the navigator and the other person actually implements the code to make the test green so they can then have a very narrow focus in their head about, well, I just have to worry about that. The navigator can then worry about the bigger picture. And then you swap over so that you don't have one person only ever seeing the big picture and one only ever thinking in the small. You swap each other. But the pairing is really important because that also helps with catching any errors that pop up making sure the test is the right test to have written, all those asking questions, all that kind of stuff. So you prevent a lot more errors going downstream by combining your TDD with pairing. You also spread knowledge, reduce the need for code reviews, those kinds of things. And code reviews are, by the way, another form of 100% inspection that Deming was talking about not doing in the first place. Right? So if you pair and you rotate pairs through each feature that you're doing, then you reduce the need for that code inspection. You don't need pull requests, all those kinds of things. You paired on it instead. Okay, so you're combining the development with pairing. Come on with actually talking to people. Go out and talk to your customers and say, how is this going? Is this what you need? Show them stuff early. Don't wait till the feature's done. Show them earlier. Don't wait for the fortnightly showcase or whatever you end up with in adorations. If you've got something you need a decision on, Go put it in front of them now. Spin up a test environment in AWS that has it and say, here, destroy this, please. And then it's not finished, but I need feedback. Again, people and interactions over processes and tools. If the process says wait till the showcase and you need the feedback now, stuff the process, go get the feedback. That's the other one that I like most. Silence is the sound of risk piling up. So if you have one of these dev environments where no one talks to each other and they all just sit there by themselves coding on their thing and they eventually push it and everyone wonders why everything broke, it's because they weren't talking to each other or to other people. Now importantly though, like everything we talk about, this is not a silver bullet. You can't just say, okay, let's TDD. Great. Problem solved. And there is no instant pudding, to go back to Deming again. You can't just whisk this stuff up and say, yeah, yeah, done. It actually takes a lot of practice. Okay? That's where some of the resistance comes from people. It takes practice and it takes a little while to see the investment, both in, even if you're good at it, in the tests that you have to write to start with. It takes a while to see the investment. But it is an investment in economic terms. It's a long-term investment in not sending defective stuff down the line to people who depend on it. So therefore, you don't have to do the rework, and therefore, you don't have to keep on wastefully going back to the same thing because it works the first time. And that's where you get the long-term economic benefit and the ability to respond to change and all of the other things that we were talking about. I can't state that enough. This actually is one of the keys. If you don't have someone to practice this with that will actually help you and knows it perhaps better than you, or at least you'll want to try and figure it out together, then you, you will have problems. So trying to find a, a group of people to sit around and do uh, the Japanese term everyone likes is dojo. It's not quite right, but it's close enough. Um, just find a group of like-minded people who want to go learn this stuff and go find a way to learn it. Um, and that could be just something in your company. Uh, we do that um, Friday, no, uh, middle of the week, usually Wednesday afternoon, it's about five o'clock. There'll be a, a, a room full of, you know, five devs or something who are just getting better at doing this stuff. And that's great. So you really do need help. Um, if you can, try and find someone who's really good at this and actually use them as a mentor as well. And also, the pairing helps with this because if you're pairing between, say, a senior dev or at least a more experienced person in terms of TDD, 
and someone who's less experienced, possibly a junior dev, possibly not, whatever. I mean, some senior devs wouldn't know TDD either, that's fine. Um, if if you're, you allow yourself to be mentored, that's awesome because you will actually learn something. The point is, the person mentoring you will also learn from it. Teaching is the most effective way of getting past the, well, I think I know everything now, okay? Until you start teaching, some of you are like, oh, I don't know crap. Because you have to now explain it to somebody, and that's when you really start mastering things, is when you have to teach them to somebody else. This works both ways. So the most important thing is to don't go and read a book about it, don't just listen to this talk about it, um, don't just go to websites or watch videos. Actually go and do it. You go and find something you want to code on and hopefully something that someone's going to pay for. And you just learn by doing it with others. I actually do have some specific things I can talk about at the very end that I have picked up that I think are fun to try this. My point is it is absolutely worth the investment, the economic investment, to actually do this because it pays off in the long run. And that's actually it. I did want to talk about just some specifics and some ideas, but uh, this is me on Twitter, and I occasionally post these kinds of stupid things as well, so I thought I'd put them up. Um, so one of the things that I just want to go back to, one of the things I've found um, useful, I program in Ruby as well as a few other things, but Ruby's the latest thing. There's a site called Ruby Warrior, for example, which is absolutely hilarious. It's uh, an 8-bit uh, dungeon crawl through a computer game that you have to get your character through by writing Ruby code. That's a lot of fun. And, and literally there's a class that you can interact with that um, basically you have a warrior and you say, okay, so the warrior can feel and they get a space back and that space either has a monster in it or it's empty or it's got some stuff in it. But they're, they're classes. And the thing is, you can't control that stuff. You can't get into it, you can't change it, because it's part of that. You can control your own code, the, the actual, your, um, you know, your actual adventurer type class. You can interact with the warrior and therefore the space. That's it. So if you wanted to TDD through that, you have to mock those things out. And you get really good at mocking very quickly, because you just say, it says, um, your warrior has these methods it can call, and the space returns these things if you call those methods. You've got to mock those out to actually test them. You, you, know, so you can't get hold of them, which is fantastic. And it's just lots of fun getting through to you know level 20, hacking away at stuff with your warrior. It's, it's awesome. Um, now, I've got a few minutes, so I'm very happy to answer any questions. If anything's burning in people's heads, yep. Um, how do you? I'm not a developer. I'm QA manager. Yes. might have a QA hat and a BA hat while they're originally in the kickoff, and they might wander off and actually develop the card. You could do that too. No hard and fast rules, do what works for you. Yes? Sorry, I'll get to uh, you in a second. Uh, can you think of a scenario wherein uh, you might completely like, clean up working? Okay, there are some situations where TDD probably won't be worth doing. And that's if you really have a something that you absolutely have no clue if it's going to be any value to your customer at all, like a uh, lean startup uh, uh, situations often come up where really this is something that, okay, I just want to hack this thing and put something in front of people to even see if they care at all, because I have no idea. The product owner's like, oh, right? That's the kind of thing where that could be actually a cheaper way of getting that feedback. But the most important thing then is if they say, yes, we want that, you have to take what you hacked, throw it away, and start again with TDD. That's the important thing. The letting go of what we already have part is what we get wrong. We keep it, and it's an awful hack. So then it becomes hard to change, it becomes costly to maintain, 
and then we start to lose the return on the investment of this awesome idea that everyone had in the hack day or whatever. Doing, yeah, doing TDD on a hack day is probably going to end up with no useful hack at the end of the day, right? That's what we're talking about. You had a question? My question is actually quite related to that. So in a consulting environment, you often find that the Ooh. client doesn't know what they want until you show them what they don't want. And if yes. you develop in a TDD way, you end up having to unwind a lot of tests to rebuild some new tests to then change the feature that you've already got in place. Yeah. What's your process on doing that if you have that Yeah. Um, the main answer for that is split the stories down so small that you only have to underwind tiny pieces and you get guidance earlier. That's the, the general thing. If you find that you've done two weeks of work and then that whole sprint has been wasted because, wow, we didn't really want that, uh, right? Maybe if you could have got that feedback earlier, after two days, maybe there's less work to unwind, less tests to rewrite, and you actually start guiding things much sooner. So story mapping is a really great way to split stories. There's story, the hamburger slicing method, those kinds of things. So you can start putting things in front of people quicker. And as I said, don't be a slave to your process. If Scrum says we do iterations, well, great, and that's nice. But if you really need the feedback earlier because it's a risky thing you don't know that people want, just get the feedback earlier. It's going to save you money in the long run because Rewriting two weeks of tests is costlier, yeah, than writing a day of tests or a half an hour of tests. Um, there was one important thing that just entered my head. This does not mean, by the way, that QAs are no longer useful people. Because I know there's probably... Who's a developer in the, in the room? Me? Okay. Who's a QA in the room? Right? You're going to love what I'm about to say. Uh, and who's a, uh, like a BA or a... Yeah, and project managers, there's a few of you. Yeah, okay, good, okay. So lots of devs, that's awesome. QAs. So you've seen all this and it's like, okay, the developers are building quality now, what do I do for a living? Do I have to, like, you know, I'm going to go fishing now or something, right? No. There's two kinds of testing. There's verification testing, which this actually does cover, okay? That's great, because that's boring, okay? Who, who loves walking, working through a QA script? Hands up. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. <laughs> Interesting people aside, um, nobody loves uh, working through QA scripts, okay? The other kind of testing, right? Exploratory testing. That I cannot write software for until we come up with thinking computers and Skynet and Terminators. Because that requires this, okay? This is what I would like QAs to be using for me. Is that QA brain that I, I'm too busy developing to have everything in my head that a QA is going to do to try and break my stuff, right? But that isn't the verification testing, that's the exploratory testing. It's all the nooks and crannies once it's integrated with the rest of the system that I had no idea that thing affected this thing five modules across that they don't even connect to each other at all. But it still broke it anyway. Good QAs with good exploratory testing skills have a nose for that stuff and will go and find it. That's what I like. That, by the way, is the stuff you actually want to see failing every now and then. Don Renitson has an awesome book, the uh, Lean Product Development Flow book, basically, right? And that book talks about how exploratory testing, um, if there's a 50% chance, there's two options, right? There's a pass or a fail, right? Those are your two options. You actually, to get the best economic benefit from exploratory testing, it should actually find something about 50% of the time. Now that sounds weird, right? But we're not talking about verification testing. That should always pass, right? And that's why your test should always be green. But the verification testing, if you're going to spend the money on having an intelligent person sit and try and break your stuff, if you know they're not going to find anything, they might as well go fishing. If you know they're going to find something, you might as well develop longer and fix it yourself. If there's a half and half chance, that's maximising your return on their wage for what they are doing, using their brain, exploring in your code. I'm going to leave you to digest that one. That's, that one's hard to swallow sometimes. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yes? Um, performance testing... The, one of the biggest evils is premature optimization. So performance testing usually 
we would try and do a little bit later on in the process once it starts hitting more real world scenarios. That could be we have to get it onto some test servers and throw it as production like load at it. That looks like, you know, test that looks like production, like staging, whatever. But um, yeah, bringing that too early into the TDD process, that can actually, you might engineer something that responds in milliseconds that actually could respond in a second and actually be fine because of the usage pattern it gets. So, you know, you can deal with that with architectures that support scaling instead, like microservice architectures, those kinds of things. You have one service that does one job, and I find out it can't handle the load. Well, brilliant. If it's only one service, I can scale it out to 100 machines in AWS, but the other rest of the system doesn't have to scale with it, so it's still cheaper to scale that one tiny bit. If you've got monoliths in a big J2EE server, and I need 100 of those, that starts costing a bucket of money. It's the simpler. So you, your architectures help with that kind of stuff instead. Yeah. Any other questions? I think I need to get out of the room because there's people piling up. Thank you very much for coming. Um, yeah, any feedback you can give me? Yeah, thank you. On Twitter or whatever, that would be really appreciated. Thanks.